Greetings, worthy supplicants to the goriest of shows. Welcome, timid hearts and frightened souls. If you doubted clicking this, it is too late. If you feared how bad my content would be, it's already worse. You are watching my channel and ready to receive that which you so secretly crave. Welcome back to Horrible, the show that knows that more importantly than that, welcome back to Slasher. Season 5 of everyone's favorite whodunit is here, and with it, a whole new cast of characters with dastardly backstories to bask in, and of course, gore galore. And since we got two jam-packed episodes to get through, insert obligatory spoiler warning here, and for the first time in a long time, let's... Break it down! It's 19th century Toronto, and we start episode 1 with this fancy lad strolling through the slums. He's eyeing some ladies of the night until he ends up fixated on a very familiar face. That is, until another familiar face comes in and uh, nips the transaction in the butt. Foreshadowing. The fancy lad goes by Jack and has a reputation for leaving the workers with more than just a mental scar. And he's warned by Horatio, clear innovator of the knuckle tat, to stay away from his roster. Jack wanders down an alley where he ends up encountering our killer for this season, the Widow. I think the costume design here is really simple but effectively eerie. The Widow's not interested in Jack's beanstalk and so she ties him to the wall, drops his pants down, and then proceeds to cut him from scrote to throat from the back with shears. Cut to the next morning and Jack's displayed corpse, which is, uh... uh detective, I'll let you take this one. His body was put on a horse post. Brutal. Because the killer wants to know if a horse post could fit in a man's ass. Now we all know. We find out from Detective Rikers, played by season three alum Gabriel Darku, that Jack's real name is Alistair Simcoe. Dope name. He's one of these rich, old money, untouchable type of people, and it seems like classism and class division is going to be a real heavy theme this season. More introductions as we get to meet Alistair's widow. Oh, uh, his grieving wife Regina, not, not the one that killed him. And also Basil Garvey, who owns the paper and a lot of other shit and is definitely going to be one of the central characters. We also meet Terrence and Sal Salome, who are played by series veterans Christopher Chico and Salvatore Antonio. They're questioned by Rikers, but they provide a solid alibi. And then there's the Botticelli sisters. There's Viviana and Venetia, played by friends of the channel, Paula Brancati and Sabrina Gerdovich. And lastly, there's Verdi, their sister, from Boston, who they're just meeting for the first time and is played by series newcomer Sadie Snow. I find these three to be the most intriguing characters so far. The Botticelli's really are a trove of treasures. But we'll get some more on that later. We get some more info on the murder when Rikers goes to meet Dr. Melanda. The knots that were around his wrists, kind common in Japan. Hmm, interesting. Earmark that. Terrence tries to make a business truce with Horatio, but it doesn't really go well after Horatio talks shit to a bunch of Basil's men. This scene sets up the climax of the show, but I mostly just wanted to use it as an example of how much I'm absolutely loving the wardrobe in this season and all the set deck. Really loved this quick scene here with the Botticelli's. Not only does it set up this like Cinderella-esque dynamic between them, but Paula's performance here really feels like an ode to Aunt Martha from Sleepaway Camp. Oh, that will not do. No, it will not do at all. No, I'm afraid that that wouldn't do. That wouldn't do at all. Let's hope there's more where that came from. I believe there's a whole bag. We then find out that Salome, Sal Salome, Salami? A apologies, I haven't heard them say it yet. Lady has a secret. And I'm uncultured. Anyway, their alibi was actually bullshit, but uh, this seems like classic deflection and they're actually performing later on the next time the widow strikes, so I'm gonna get and clear them for now. Then outside of the theater, the seeds of drama start a sprout. It's hinted that Viviana and Venetia are struggling financially and basically just trying to fake it till they make it with this whole like aristocrat lifestyle. Viviana dreams of becoming Mrs. Basil Garvey, but once he's introduced to Verdi, he becomes fixated on her throughout the entire magic show. Rikers ends up finding this note inside of Alistair's body, and it alludes to someone named Margaret and a murder that happened 12 years prior. The next scene with the three sisters is just fantastic. I'm gonna come back to more of it later, but just for now, all I'll say is that Paula absolutely stole the episode here. This was the man of I He has promised to me! Back to the devil's elbow and a possible nod to structurally similar show and TV screen. Give me your answer, <laughs> But I really do enjoy Daisy and Horatio. Too girthy for ya! <laughs> is it really as large as you say it is? And I can't wait to learn more about them as characters as the season goes up. <laughs> you killed my Daisy! 
Well, God damn it. Fucking bastard! Bastard! Luckily for him, though, the widow's here to help take his mind off of things. Like, you know, his neck. You gotta feel for Jefferson Brown. The dude's characters can never make it out of the first episode. All in all, I feel like the first entry was an awesome way to kick off the season. But with little time to waste, on to episode two. Okay, episode two opens up with a flashback to the discovery of Margaret's mutilated corpse and the subsequent hanging of the man convicted of her murder despite him proclaiming his innocence. Cut to the present day discovery of Horatio and Daisy whose body positioning might also be a reference to sleepaway camp? Or maybe I'm just shoehorning in a reason to mention that I actually got to meet Felissa Rose at a special screening of sleepaway camp. Anyways, Regina goes to meet George the Magician, who's somehow inexplicably still cleaning his saw. She's under the impression that he can speak to the beyond, and she wants him to help her try to contact Alistair. I could hold a seance. A say what? A seance. Oh, I could set the table for a revelatory seance. Breakfast scene with the Botticelli's mostly just furthers the narratives that we've already talked about, but I wanted to bring it up because I'm going to reference it later on. We then start to get some breadcrumbs into Basil's backstory as he makes Enid, played by series vet Joe Benicola, shut down the Black Widow story in the paper. Then Rikers, while being honestly a bit too nonchalant with that severed head, that is a man's head. He ends up enlightening us on a big clue. Right to left. Seriously, I have such a raging clue right now. The widow's left-handed. Enid is on a mission to take down Basil with the power of journalism and meets up with Salome to get some damning ammunition. Did ammunition? Okay, so the seance. At first it was playing out exactly like I thought it was going to with George and Shanika just kind of hustling uh, an emotionally vulnerable Regina for money. Very far ahead. But then they actually went for it and added a little bit of supernatural into the mix. And honestly, I'm fucking here for it. It was visually super well pulled off, really giving off some Evil Dead vibes. Ah! I think it fits really well given the time period, the setting, and the overall tone of the season so far. Basil then shows up to talk to Verdi, and by talk I mean, you know, pronounce his love and say that they should get married and stuff. I suggest you don't worry about this sort of thing. But of course the other two sisters walk in and they are just outraged by another Basil-based betrayal. And they, uh, lash out at Verdi to say the least. No, oh, please, I'm not knowingly doing anything to your <laughs> And the episode ends when the widow comes for Enid. To summarize, we find out that Basil is somehow responsible for the murder of Margaret. I mean, he was mad up. He was behind it all. And that Enid was complicit in help covering it up and getting the wrong man convicted. Like how you went after Andrew May for the Ripper killing, and you didn't question it. This is just an excellent and super unique kill that we better get some visual aftermath for at the beginning of next episode. <laughs> Feeling a little flat today. All right, two episodes down, and now let's get to the fun part. I'll be honest, last season totally threw me for a loop, but this season, I have a nice working theory. I do want to mention this just because it's the biggest piece of evidence that we've kind of gotten so far. If we're to follow the whole left-handed trail thing, then we can already rule out Viviana because we can see that she uses her right hand to whip Verdi. He's clear. However, we cannot rule out Venetia as we see her in episode one using her left hand to spank Verdi. But I've seen literally nothing so far that can give her any type of like relevant motive. So two episodes in, my prime suspect is actually Verdi. I see through you, you viper! I think she very easily could have gotten into town the night before with plenty of time to kill Alistair. Also, Verdi is described as worldly, whatever that means. I hope Toronto isn't too provincial for someone as worldly as you. But to me, that means that she could have easily known that Japanese method of tying up Alistair to the wall. And there's just something about the way she comes off, like she's just like always putting up a front. Like at the magic show and she just can't bear to witness. Her apology to the sisters at the breakfast just feels like this vibe but she's just trying to play them by telling them what they want to hear. You were absolutely right about everything you accused me of. I can already hear you. What's the motive? What's the motive? Motives are easy. We know that Verde and the Botticellis are only half siblings and that they share a father. It is incredible to finally meet you after the passing of our dear father. I believe that Verde is Margaret's daughter. My father's illegitimate daughter, the spawn of a whore. And that she's here as the widow to get revenge on Basil and the entire societal structure that led to the death of her mother. That would also be a seriously dark and awesome twist to the Cinderella aspect. 
But hey, you know, it's not just me and Rikers out here. This is a detective collective. So go ahead and let me know who are your top suspects. And hell, while you're already down in the devil's elbow, you might as well go ahead and do the rest of the YouTube stuff. I mean, if you don't, it's, it's fine. It's not like I'm gonna drape you over my knee about it or something. <laughs> and let's hope episode three continues to produce the magic. If not, that would be...